Buonasera, e benvenute e benvenuti anche da chi è collegato da casa. E porto il saluto eh, del professor Pedisano che purtroppo per un eh, impedimento non ha potuto essere presente, ma tanto lo vedrete al prossimo appuntamento, sarà lui a tenere la seconda lezione. Soltanto due parole per introdurre il corso di storia, archeologia e tradizione dell'antico. Il tema di quest'anno, come avrete visto dai materiali informativi, è l'arte, arte, letteratura e potere nel mondo antico, con varie declinazioni. E, mh, interverranno infatti, oltre alla professoressa Borg, a cui lascerò la parola tra poco, lo stesso Fabrizio Pedisano, Luigi Battezzato, Emanuele Berti, Gianfranco Adornato e Anna Magnetto. Come negli ultimi anni il corso è in modalità mista, quindi ci saranno un po' di persone collegate da casa che ci seguiranno, anche perché mh, con il Covid, tra le varie cose negative, ce n'è stata anche una positiva, per cui la platea eh, degli iscritti al corso si è ampliata geograficamente. Quindi prima i partecipanti erano delle scuole vicine a Pisa, era più semplice per loro arrivare, ora ci sono iscritti anche di altre regioni, per cui sarebbe impossibile supporre una loro partecipazione in presenza. Quindi, niente, eh, mi limito a ringraziarvi per eh, il rinnovato interesse verso questa nostra iniziativa e lascio subito la parola alla professoressa Borg, che ci parlerà di Roman State Monuments, Propaganda or Dialogue. Grazie. Buonasera a tutti e tutte. Um, this lecture, as you will have known, will be in English. I hope you don't mind. I try to speak slowly and clearly so that you can understand me. Um, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please interrupt me at any moment. I am happy to do this not just as a frontal lecture, but in a kind of dialogue. So whether it is that you don't understand my English or whether it is that you have a question um, that is urgent on, on what I am presenting on, um, just kick in and, and ask, um, and I'm happy to, to interrupt at any moment and explain um, a little bit more. Um, The, the lecture I have chosen, um, Propaganda or, do, or, or Dialogue in Roman State Monument, um, is, I think, an important one when we consider politics and how political ideas were communicated in the ancient world and thereby also how power was established in the ancient world. Um, we very often Um, read in publications on state monuments, and I, I um, refer to state monuments, that those, um, by those I mean monuments that have been um, built, uh, commissioned um, by an emperor or by the Senate normally. Um, so such pu public monuments are very often considered under the term of propaganda. And it is usually said, Augustus wanted to say this, and Trajan wanted people to understand that. And um, everything is very, very, very much focused on the emperor himself, and the monuments are treated like Um, like election posters in our modern day, which are you know, circulated all over the city or, um, or, or distributed on, on Facebook and throughout the media, um, where politicians or certain parties had, were, had a keen interest to convince the general public of certain ideas, of certain political programs, and things like that. Um, now, for the Roman world, there are a number of issues with this idea of propaganda, um, part of which um, have to do with modern connotations, because in the ancient world there was very little um, that, would have, um, that would have been centrally distributed to the general public population. Maybe coins is the only means that was really widely um, circulating in Roman society, and co coins, of course, had images and had writing, and so maybe coins come closest to what we call propaganda. 
Whereas other things such as the, 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 the art decoration in public spaces were obviously only accessible and only visible to those who had to go to those um, places um, and not to the wider public. Um, and uh, so the audience for them were, was already rather limited. Um, and this is something that in uh, the modern concept of propaganda is, is not really normally the case. Um, another thing is that monuments obviously in Rome would be very much focused on people living in Rome and not necessarily to people in the whole empire. Um, and so the term propaganda has been, um, has been criticized by some scholars for the ancient world as they said this term comes with so much modern baggage, with so much expectation that come from modern media um, that maybe it should be abolished for Rome entirely or for the ancient world entirely. Then again, maybe that means throwing out the baby with the bathwater because public monuments were obviously created to convey a message, to convey a message at a larger public. And, um, and as we just said, coins were circulated extremely widely and the, and the ideas that we find on coins are often quite political, such as military victories or the celebration of certain virtues of the emperor, um, certain building projects. So a wide range of things that contribute to establishing the power of the emperor were distributed on coins. Um, so personally, I am not necessarily opposed to using the term propaganda for the ancient world. Having said that, I think it is still often applied in far too general a way. And the reason is that not all monuments that we find have necessarily been designed or commissioned by the emperor. And um, if we look, with, look in more detail at individual case studies, we will find that it does indeed matter whether it was the emperor himself who erected, um, a, who erected a monument or built a space such as a former forum, or whether it may have been the Senate, for instance, who may have had different ideas of what to propagate to the Roman public. And it is uh, this um, aspect which, uh, on which I would like to focus today and show you how it really matters who was the patron of a particular monument. I will start with two um, monuments built under the rule of Augustus, which is, no, this doesn't work, to point on the left-hand side, um, a nice reconstruction uh, of the Forum of Augustus, and on the right-hand side, um, the famous Arapakis. Um, I would like to talk about the Forum of Augustus first, um, uh, which, um, as we shall see, was built by the emperor and most likely very closely um, designed um, according to his very own ideas. Uh, just very briefly to show where it is situated, here you have a, a map of Rome. This black line is the Aurelian Wall, which obviously did not exist at the time when the Forum was first built, but for orientation it is quite helpful. It's always helpful to look at the Colosseum for orientation. That obviously also didn't exist when the Forum of Augustus was built, but for orientation it's useful. Forum of Augustus is here, the Capitolium, the Capitoline Hill is over here, um, the, the uh, Palatine uh, with the Imperial Palace is over there, and obviously the Forum Romanum here between all of them. 
on the right uh, hand side you have the form, oops, the form Romanum here um, and then the form Julium which is the one that was built um, by Caesar and then next to it the form of Augustus. Ah, uh, okay, should I take that one because the, the, the pointer doesn't work with me. So we have the Forum of Augustus right next to the Forum <coughs> of his adoptive father, um, Julius Caesar. The Forum itself, just a few facts here on the slide. Um, it was uh, newly built uh, by Augustus and contained most prominently, as you can see here in the reconstruction, a temple for Mars Ultor, Mars obviously the, uh, the god of war, and uh, Ultor is the avenger, and it was, uh, the temple was vowed, at least um, according to Suetonius, was vowed um, in uh, 42 BC, just before the famous and important battle um, uh, against the assassins of Julius Caesar, um, so that is the the revenge that is um, uh, that is uh, referred to with the term with with the name Mars Ultor, um, and uh, the whole forum took quite a while to be finished and was finally dedicated in 2 BC. Um, here in the photograph on the top, you can see a you can see what the forum looks like today. It is partly cut off cut off by a modern street. Um, so what we see today is only part of it, but the whole temple of Mars Ultra we can still identify with the frontal stairs um, and then uh, the temple set against the back wall that closes off the forum against uh, the densely built um, living quarters behind it. And just a nice detail um, of the marble work um, on this forum, which belongs to the finest um, of architecture and arts that we have from the Roman world. Um, on the left-hand side, you have an uh, up-to-date um, plan of the forum. Um, it is, as we just said, cut through by the modern road about here. Um, but recent excavations have brought to light some parts of the architecture underneath the road and on the other side of the road so that it now looks like there were actually this uh, rectangular space with two semicircular um, large niches um, uh, um, that, that, that bulge out uh, from the rectangular shape. In the center, uh, the temple we have already looked at um, uh, in, and in front of it, in the center of the open space, there was, and that we only know from literary sources, there was a quadriga, a four-horse chariot with Augustus as pater patriae, so as father of the fatherland. Um, so everything sort of culminates with him in the center of the forum. The temple itself is very much focused on, uh, on Augustus and his own family and Julius Caesar as the father who was avenged in the victory. Um, again, we know the details partly from literary descriptions and partly from other monuments that seem to co have copied the statue decoration um, of the temple. So, to start with the statues that were up there on a big basis at, in the apse of the temple. Um, there, are, uh, there were statues of uh, Venus, of Mars himself, um, of, and of Divus Julius, so of the deified uh, Julius Caesar, um, uh, who was of course um, Augustus' father. We have one relief uh, that shows uh, three figures that are normally 
uh, which you can see they are um, not figure, it's not a relief of the real deities, but you can see that they all stand on pedestals. And so it is a relief showing statues, not showing the real divinities. And, uh, the, um, and the group as we have it here, with this guy being clearly a portrait and with a hole in the head where um, the star um, the, the star, the symbol of um, Caesar's deification was fixed probably in bronze or in gilded bronze. Um, so these are, are pro this relief is probably a reflection of the statues in the cellar. Um, and this um, copy of a statue of Mars Ultor um, is uh, likely to be copied also after the cult statue that was in the temple. Um, we also have some idea of what the, the pediment on the outside of the temple looked like. Um, and this we can infer from another relief, which you, sh which you see here on the top, um, th with, th from the so-called Arapietatis, where the temple in the background in front of which a sacrifice is taking place um, has a number of figures that fit quite nicely with what we know of the temple decoration. And so uh, we probably have here the river Tiber, then Roma, the personification of Rome, then Venus, uh, then Mars in the center, then Fortuna with, uh, with the cornucopia, um, then Romulus, um, and uh, then the Mons Palatinos, the, the mountain of the Palatine. We also have some idea of uh, what the colonnades around the forum looked like, of which again we have two very nice reconstructions here and a photograph of the colored marbles that are preserved from this forum. And it has been argued that actually the choice of several different kinds of marbles, yellow, bluish, green, two types of green marble, and this red type of marble, and then white as well, that they represent the different parts of the Roman Empire from which these marbles have been imported. And so they sort of symbolize the whole Roman world that the Romans had conquered at this particular coin, uh, uh, point in time. Some further decoration on the top in the attic, uh, which I will um, not talk about today. And then what is further very uh, significant is the sculpture decoration, which once was situated in these exedrae, in these semicircular niches, and then along in the porticos um, along the forum itself. In the left exedra, uh, there was a statue of Aeneas, um, fleeing Troy with his father Anchises sitting on his shoulder and leading his, uh, his uh, young son Julius Ascanius and Julius Ascanius obviously is the first member of the Julian family of that name and because Julius Ascanius was a grandson of Enea, uh, of, um, uh, of Anchises um, uh, Aeneas, fa no, so, sorry, was um, was was a, a, a son of Aeneas, who, it, by the goddess Aphrodite or Venus, this is where the Julian Claudian Julio Claudian um, family traced how they, they traced their ancestry back to the goddess Venus. So Venus was not just any divinity who was important for Rome, but she was the ancestry, ancestress of the, Julio, of, of the Julian family. That is also why she appears in the temple several times and not because of her love affair with Mars. That was not relevant in this context. She is there as the ancestry, ancestress uh, of the Julians. We have uh, no uh, or very little direct knowledge of what these statues looked like, but they did appear on some coins. And we have here 
um, some indication of, uh, without um, Julius Ascanius in this case, um, of, of what the statue must have looked like, with Aeneas carrying his father. And then there are two very important um, uh, paintings from Pompeii, which probably depict very closely the statue groups from the Forum. Um, here we have Aeneas with his father and his son, and then we have Romulus, who was situated in the exedra on the other side with the spolia opima, with the spoils of war. So, um, so th this is another very interesting aspect of, um, of how images were actually taken seriously and, in, and, and had power over the people because Pompeii is, of course, a provincial city in the south of Italy, and that they should copy in painting images that were situated in Rome um, is quite remarkable and shows local approval in the rest of Italy of these kinds of ideas that were expressed in the Forum of Augustus. So it is not just us archaeologists who believe that our materials are so important in the ancient world, um, but we have proof that they worked. Um, and, and, and that is, among other things, these reliefs and the paintings <laughs> and uh, copies of the decoration from the Forum, uh, which were found uh, in other parts of Italy and even outside of Italy. So we have Aeneas here in the left, on the left, Romulus, um, who uh, obviously refers to the foundations of Rome and to victory with his folia opima on the right. Um, so two, two individuals who were, um, who were essential for the foundation of Rome and who symbolized the beginnings of Rome. And then around them, we had on the left, surrounding Aeneas, the kings of Alba Longa, the city he first founded, and, um, and members of the Julian family. Whereas around Romulus, um, we had the so-called Sumiviri, um, the most important um, member, the most important historical figures of Rome. Um, this is again um, a very helpful illustration of what roughly the the, how, what the space must have felt like uh, with, um, you know, where you can see the proportions of real people and the statues. Um, here, the left exedra with Aeneas. Um, and we know from literary sources that court cases were held, were heard in the exedra and in the forum. So lots of official business took place there. And then in the background, we see the niches with the statues here of the kings of Alba Longa and of the Julian family. Um, <clears throat> the uh, list of the Sumiviri, uh, so the worthiest members of uh, the Roman, uh, of, of Rome, um, is um, unfortunately not complete. We only have some in, of the inscriptions that were, um, that were published underneath the statues. Um, but from what we, from the names that we've got, and also from Suetonius, um, of whom I have put a quote here, uh, we know that that they, um, um, that they, you know, people who had brought the Roman people from its modest beginnings to its present position of greatness and world rule. So these are the people who were depicted in those statues. And what is interesting here is that Augustus chose not just individuals from the more recent history um, who were all sort of on, on one political side, but he also included rival generals when they were considered uh, by him um, to have contributed to Rome's greatness, for instance, uh, by, um, by their victories uh, over parts of what then became the Roman Empire. Um, 
Of the statues, as I said, there is very little preserved. I'm showing you a few fragments here, which are now exhibited in the, in the Mercati Trajani in Rome, above and behind the Forum uh, of Trajan. Um, here, to one fragment um, that is probably from the statue of Romulus, another general's fragment, one person with a toga. We can see that from these curvy lines of the dress. Um, so a senatorial member who was considered to be great. And a beautiful leg with a boot, which is a military boot. So the statues must have been both um, generals in their military garb, but also civilians in their togas. Um, so much very, for very briefly on the forum um, on the Forum of Augustus. Are there, are there any questions for now on the Forum itself? I would then go on to talk about the Arapakis in contrast, and then maybe we can also discuss a little bit what the differences between the two monuments are. Any questions on the Forum? Um, sorry? Yes? I had the question. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to know if the, um, um, the, the paintings you showed coming from Pompeii and the coins are contemporary to the uh, sculpture groups coming from the Xetuanian. I'm referring to the uh, group with Aeneas and Anchises. The coins you shown uh, are the coins you shown and, and the paintings from Pompeii contemporary. Um, very good question. The coin, I believe, um, I should have checked, um, but the coin, oops, ah, what's going on now? Echo. I believe that the coin is an earlier one. So, it, it, because it, it is not showing exactly the statue group, um, it's because uh, here we have Aeneas, um, holding actually the Palladion, the statue of Athena in his right hand, and not uh, Julius Ascanius. So this is probably an earlier coin, um, which is simply showing that the importance of Aeneas fleeing Rome as one um, who contributed you know, to the foundation of Rome was very important. But the paintings on Pompeii are definitely later. Now, I do not exactly know um, how late they are being considered to be, um, but definitely later than the Forum of Augustus. I think they are dated only to, um, you know, to the latest phase of Pompeii, but I would need to double check that. May I ask you another thing? Sure. Maybe? Um, so, um, we can consider the um, growth, the, the, I'm refer with, referring with the paint, world paintings uh, from Pompeii. Can we uh, think uh, about um, source? I mean, the Exedra, the grass culture group in the Exedra, can be considered a source for the world paintings with the uh, ideological implications, or it is just a decorative uh, motif which, is, which, is, which spread out during the empire? I think we can, in this case, be sure that it was the statues in the forum itself, because there were also inscriptions that copied the inscriptions from the forum of Augustus. For reasons of time, I haven't put them in this PowerPoint, um, but these inscriptions are copies after um, the inscriptions underneath the statues of Romulus and Aeneas. And for that reason, we can be pretty certain that these were copies of the statues, albeit in painting. Um, also, there are other copies um, of those statues in other media from other places, which confirm this very same iconography of the images. And so when you have several um, several copies of a same original, then you start thinking about what may have been the original and the likelihood is the Forum of Augustus, in particular when those two people who really don't have that much to do with, it, with each other, Aeneas and Romulus, appear as a pair. 
In Pompeii, there is also another very funny um, 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 painting where both um, Aeneas and Romulus have become dogs. And that must be a parody of the original statue group. This is also a reception of the um, monuments and messages coming from Rome, but one that is actually poking fun of it. Um, whether that is from a, criti from, from a critic of Augustus or whether it was just a joke, obviously we don't know because there is no text attached to them. Um, but the repetition of these same figures in several places make it pretty certain that they were copied after the originals in Rome. How exactly that was done, whether someone went to Rome and made a drawing and brought the drawing then to Pompeii and that's how the paintings were done, we can only speculate on that because we simply don't know. Thank you very much, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, then, so, so just to recapitulate what we have here in the forum. We have a forum which, as we know from the sources, was built by Augustus on land that he himself had purchased from the owners of the land uh, that of, uh, uh, of that particular piece, uh, part of the city. Um, we have a temple that is celebrating war in the guise of Mars and also a particular war um, of revenge. We also then have a, se uh, have a celebration of the beginnings of Rome and of its development over time um, with the greatest men being lined up in these porticos and everything culminates with Augustus in the center of the forum uh, where his quadriga is advertising him as pater patriae. So the whole history of Rome is, um, is sort of, you know, working its way up to Augustus who is the savior and a kind of new founder also of the city because as he is juxtaposed with Romulus and Aeneas, he styles himself as another founder of Rome um, and very much a founder who builds on military successes. Um, as we know that Augustus, Augustus came up with the idea for this project and bought the land and financed everything, we can be reasonably certain that he was strongly involved in designing the concept for this message which the forum exuded. <coughs> now, this is quite different from another monument, um, the Arapakis. I'm showing here on the right-hand side a river, and then a little further down uh, this important role um, we had uh, the Arapakis at this place here. Um, and um, here was the, or still is, the um, mausoleum of Augustus. Today, the Arapakis um, has, of course, been uh, moved to very close where his mausoleum is, but originally um, it was uh, erected here on the Fria Flaminia, um, one of the major roads on which Augustus was uh, expected to return to Rome from his military campaigns in Spain. The, um, the Arapakis was dedicated to Augustus and not by Augustus um, and inaugurated in 9 uh, BC. Um, here is a, a very brief uh, or, or a very helpful um, drawing of what it consisted of, and you can see some of that also in the photograph. Um, the ar ara, obviously meaning uh, altar, the, the ara pazis did not just consist of the altar proper, the, um, the altar is here in the center on a stepped platform, um, but it was surrounded by 
um, a wall that was decorated on the inside and the outside. And on the outside, we had uh, quite different reliefs. Uh, we had Mars and Aeneas on, the, on, on this side. Ita well, Italia, Tellus, Roma, we look at her in the, uh, uh, Pax, we look at her in a moment. And Roma on the other side. Um, so two male heroes, two, ma two female people, and then we had reliefs on the long side with certain members of the Julian family included. Let's have a very quick look at the images. On the west side, we, had, uh, we have this famous relief, which you probably all know, um, of a female divinity with uh, two children, um, so with uh, fruit and, and other things in her lap, with animals grazing and lying down at her feet, with water being symbolized over here, um, and a river over here, with um, two other female divinities, which are very difficult to name, um, but which symbolize in some way or another the sea and the land with rivers. Um, you can also see the sea monster here, which makes clear that she is representative of the sea. So it is a cosmological image on one hand, which includes everything that the world is made of, um, but with a focus of the abundance that the world um, is, uh, is creating, the abundance um, and, uh, and fertility, obviously, all coming together in this one image. So what the message is of the relief is pretty clear. There can be no doubt. Um, there is a huge debate among scholars of what the name of this goddess is. Personally, I don't think the name is important. I cannot see how the Romans would have identified the goddess by name, but what they did understand is what her character is, what she stands for. She may be Pax, so the goddess of peace, to whom the altar was dedicated. Um, and the whole idea of the Arapakis seems to be that peace and abundance and a golden age is being built on victory. And so Puck on, on victory and then the peace following on from victory. So Pax Modweg proper sense here, um, but I think it is not ultimately terribly important how we name her. There was another relief we have just seen on the other side of the entrance on the west side, um, showing Roma with seated on weapons. Only this fragment has been preserved, but we can see the weapons and we can see, can see the dress and the leg. And this is one possible reconstruction of the relief. On the other side, we have probably Aeneas sacrificing um, uh, uh, and um, a, a black and white photograph of the full relief and uh, a color photograph of parts of it. So that may be Aeneas sacrificing another image of the beginnings of Rome, of the origins of Rome, and the fragments that have been preserved of the other relief um, showed Mars and Faustulus. And with these two, four, two figures, there must have been the Lupa Romana, the she-wolf with the twin boys of Romulus and Remus. So this side, while the other side shows, symbolizes, I should say, symbolizes in these personifications the greatness of Rome uh, in the present time and the golden age that Augustus has brought um, to Rome and that peace has brought to Rome after the terrible civil war that raged before Augustus took power. The other side, um, again, refers to the beginnings of Rome with Romulus and Remus and probably with Aeneas. There is some debate on this uh, left relief whether that might be Numa Pompilius, um, but I don't think 
uh, that is important for us. In any case, this is definitely one of the founding myths, um, which is also one that shows the piety, the pietas, um, that is at the heart um, of uh, the foundations of Rome and its greatness, we can infer. On the outside, we have lots of um, vegetation, uh, beautiful, um, beautiful tendrons and leaves and fruit um, and um, swans as the symbol of Apollo, uh, to whom Augustus felt particularly adapted. So well, these could be read again as symbolizing the golden age um, and uh, the benefits that came with it. On the inside, then, here you have a drawing where you can see what the altar looked like on the inside. There are further reliefs. Um, there are garlands with offering dishes and bull's heads, which again allude to sacrifice. And then on the altar itself, there is a frieze running all around, running on, on both sides of the altar with a sacrificial procession. So a procession, a religious procession that ends in a sacrifice. We can see here several animals that were led to be sacrificed. And here we see the Vestal Virgins um, who were uh, an important priesthood in Rome. So the inside is all about religion and about piety um, and cult. Now the final element which is very important are the two long friezes on the longer sides of the Arapakis um, of uh, lots and lots of individual figures, some in the foreground, others a little further in the background. I am showing uh, this detail here um, so that you can see a little bit the quality of the reliefs. Um, we have Agrippa here, who was Augustus' main general um, and also son-in-law, and then a number of family members. Some of their identity is disputed, um, and also other senators, anonymous uh, senators following on. Um, this uh, image, I do not expect you to be able to read all this, um, but what is important, and maybe you can read that, is who in general is being depicted on this frieze. Now, to find Augustus is actually not that easy, and not just because the frieze um, is partly destroyed. This is Augustus. So he is not right in the middle. He is not at the end of the frieze where everybody is going, is walking to. He is somewhere sort of, you know, in the, in the left half. He is doing a sacrifice here. He is slightly taller than the people around, around him, but only just. He is, there are other people who are taller than him. Agrippa here in the center is much more prominent, is much more visible, and is also taller than Augustus there on the left. Also, um, he and his family members who are sort of, you know, dotted here, the, the, the naming of them is very difficult, and it is doubtful. They are so idealized with their faces in hairdress that it is doubtful that even the Romans could identify every single person. Um, so here are certainly some recognizable family members, but perhaps with mixed in with others. So there may be the family, but then there is here the Flamines, a priesthood, the Augurs, um, a priesthood, and then the Pontifices, the highest priesthood of whom um, Augustus was the head. So we have Augustus and his family surrounded by the most important priesthoods um, of the Roman Republic, which allegedly Augustus restored when he ended the civil wars. Um, and on the other side, we probably have a few more family members um, that may or may not be identifiable here on the left. Um, but then we have further 
priesthoods. We have the Quinn de Quemviri Sacris Faciundis, um, who were in charge of the foreign cults and of the Sibylline books. Um, then we have more augurs, probably, and the Septemviri, who were, uh, who were in charge of ceremonial religious banquets. So, um, this is a very remarkable, let me see, just see whether or not, this is a very remarkable um, arrangement where Augustus himself is depicted only once and not necessarily in the most prominent position. And he is surrounded by the most important priesthoods on a monument that is celebrating Rome's greatness and the beginnings of a new golden age that has started with Augustus bringing, priest, uh, bringing peace to Rome and restoring the Republic, notionally anyway. But it is clearly not a celebration of the emperor himself. We do, not, we do have beginnings and the results, but Augustus himself is not the focus point. It is, if you wish, it is the, the religion that has made Rome great from the sacrifices at the very beginnings of the foundations to the present occasion on which the Arapakis was dedicated, which was Augustus' return from a military campaign. There's nothing military there, nothing. And Augustus also is obviously in civilian dress in his toga. So, I would argue that the difference between the Forum and the Arapakis is quite striking and that it is also not accidental because the Senate, who wanted to honor Augustus on his return from his campaign, could have built anything. They were not obliged to build an altar. So that is the first decision that the Senate made. And then the program of images is also something that the Senate could decide and they chose a program that is very different from the one that Augustus had chosen for his own forum. And, um, and, and so I believe that these two monuments express ex demonstrate extremely well the contrast between, or, or the importance of looking at who was actually the patron of such a monument. Um, and um, who was the patron of such a monument and, and that even when everything, all of this happened under Augustus' rule and is celebrating in some way Augustus, it does not mean that everything is Augustus' propaganda. Um, yeah, questions? on the Arapakis or on the more general point I want to make here. Sorry, can I again? Sure. Even if I spoke before. Yes, please. <laughs> Sorry. No. Uh, just a question about the citation. I mean, could it be possible that uh, the different historical situation uh, in which the Forum was built up and the Arapaches was built up had a sort of influence on uh, the um, um, program or on building itself. Uh, I mean, um, in uh, I, I, the Forum of Augustus was dedicated in 2 BC. At the center was the uh, Temple of Mars Ultor. And maybe Augustus was there was at this time was at that time more um, I mean interest in uh, defining and telling this strict relationship with uh, uh, Divus Julius, and instead uh, in 9 
um, BC, the situation was, was quite different. The Gerson itself was near to the end, I mean, I think. Is there any link, any relationship with historical situation? I think Sorry for my English, it's a long time, I don't no, speak don't, English. No, don't worry, so. it's perfect, it's perfect. And if anyone would prefer to ask in Italian, that's also fine. My understanding of Italian is better than my spoken Italian. Um, um, well, the no, I think that I yeah. think that is I, I think that is a very good question. One could you know one should consider the historical circumstances, um, and and they may have played a role, um, but then again, um, Augustus wasn't quite at the end of his life when the Arapakis or the Forum was dedicated, and the Forum was dedicated later than the Arapakis. Um, um, so, and also the Arapakis, while the, while the forum, the occasion on which the forum was built was revenge on the assassins of his divine father, the occasion on which the Senate dedicated this monument to Augustus was his return from a military campaign. So, to this extent, I would argue there were similar circumstances. And had the Senate wanted to propagate the, um, the importance of Augustus' victory, they could have built a monument on which we see scenes of war, or Augustus coming home with spoils, um, or um, other scenes that are more militaristic, which have existed in other places and later on, as we can see in the second hour. And so um, it is, um, and, and so I, I believe that there is too little difference in the historical circumstances to explain this discrepancy. Um, but it seems to me far more likely that those who commissioned the monuments were giving their own interpretation of what they considered important in relation to the emperor. Um, and for the Senate, this was a difficult time because obviously the, 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 um, the principate, the um, rule of one man who we, know, who, who we call emperor was only being established at that moment. Notionally, Augustus had restored the Republic and he was quite clever in doing so because he must have learned from the, from the generals before him that when one is too ambitious and one opposes his peers and the other senatorial families, too fiercely, one, one doesn't last, like, um, you know, like um, uh, Pompey the Great had to experience, like uh, Sulla found out, like Julius Caesar himself found out. Um, they tried too hard to establish themselves uh, in um, positions of power. But Augustus must have concluded that by force, by military force alone, he would not be able to survive for very long. So he established this very strange system whereby he made sure that all important positions in the state were remained in his hands, and also he still had his, um, you know, his, his um, troops uh, on, whom, on which he could rely. But at the same time, he restored the republic restored all the ancient cults, um, restored the priesthood so that they could function again, and they gave, he gave back the power to the Senate as, an, as the most important ruling body in the state. Um, and I think it is indicative that the Senate who commissioned the Arapakis 
took from this whole bag of ideological diverse elements which Augustus propagated in one way or another, the Senate picked those elements of the new Augustan system which suited their own needs best, which demonstrated their significance through the peace, priesthoods and which in a way um, suggested that obeying by the rules of religion is what the state is ultimately based on. So the message, while it is not contrary to what Augustus had um, started to, uh, to, to develop for the state, it is one particular aspect that suited the Senate particularly well. Any other questions? No, okay. Um, then I think we should have um, a break of roughly 10 minutes so that you can uh, you know, walk about if you wish, um, smoke a cigarette outside, it's still nice and sunny, um, and we resume in about uh, 10 minutes. Or do you all wish to continue? I mean, it's up to you if you... I, I have been told, this is the first time I'm doing this, so I have been told that normally there is a break so that people can go out um, if they want. Anyone would like a break? Cinque minuti? Okay. I think we can, we can continue. Um, and before I present a few other monuments which we may consider under this, um, under this new perspective. I would like to ask again whether there are any questions or any doubts um, of what I suggested. Um, do you think that is, um, that is, it, it is adequate that to look at patrons in this way, or do you feel that maybe it was still Augustus who was pulling the strings behind the scene? Um, any further so thoughts on this before we go on? Okay. Um, I think these two monuments are among the most clear-cut cases, perhaps, which show us what patronage, how patronage matters. Um, a more difficult case is the form of Trajan, which in many ways um, links with the form of Augustus, but presents again a number of really interesting problems, and I think there is less of a clear, um, less of a clear picture as to who was responsible for what at that time. For once, I think um, we we need to consider that times had in fact changed since then. So. Um, the question of the colleague online who had asked whether the historical situation matters um, is, of course, a very, a very valid one and a very important one. And I argue ju just that the situation under Augustus was very specific in that he had only just introduced a system which made him sole ruler, but pretended to still continue the republic, where he was very keen to convey to the Senate the, its importance, that it was still the most important body ruling the state. With time, things, things of course, changed, partly through people who 
members of the Julio-Claudian family who um, were less cautious about their position in the state and who pushed the boundaries of what an emperor could get away with further and further. So one scholar has described that very well in, in an interesting article, the, the history from the beginnings of the Roman, of, of the Roman principate, as we call the, this type of, um, of rulership which Augustus established, the, prin prin the principate a call after, you know, he was princeps inter pares, the first among equals. And the equals is really important in, for Augustus, it was really important for Augustus. But this relationship between the, the emperor and the state bodies and the senate in particular, um, with many of them coming from old, important, powerful families, this relationship was under constant negotiation and emperors tended to try to push the boundaries and to see to what extent they might be able to establish themselves more as rulers um, like they existed in, uh, in, um, uh, in monarchies rather than in republics. So they wanted to be much more of what it meant to be first among equals. That changed over time a lot. It changed in regard to how the emperors were, um, were honored by the Senate, but also by other people. How in particular, their status, their divine status was perceived, changed a lot over time. While living emperors were never worshipped as divine beings, as gods, in the earlier um, times of the empire by the senate, other people, other provinces, other cities started increasingly to worship also the living emperor as a living god. And so, um, so emperors such as Caligula or then also Nero and later Domitian, they really tried to establish a kind of divine rulership which was more akin to a proper monarchy than the principate that Augustus had established. And as we know, um, quite a few of them did not end well. They were assassinated. Um, and these assassinations were partly the result of them non, not succeeding in, in, in maintaining the kind of equilibrium and acceptance of by the Senate, which they needed to actually survive in this system. There were other complications which had to do with the military as well, um, but, but the negotiations between Senate and Emperor of what this relationship should be like um, was a very, very important factor. And by the time of Trajan, um, in, uh, at the turn of the first and the second century, um, this relationship had changed very considerably. Um, Trajan himself was very keen to, after, after what was by many perceived as a disaster of the rule of Domitian, especially the senatorial class, <coughs> Sorry. Um, felt that Domitian had really pushed the boundaries too hard although he was very popular with large swathes of the, of the general population. <coughs> so after the murder of, of, of Domitian and the very short rule of Nerva, his successor, Trajan was very keen on 
re-establishing a good relationship with the Senate and again present himself as first among equals. But as we can see, for instance, from the letters that, um, that Pliny exchanged with Trajan, <clears throat> this relationship had still changed and the emperor was now in a much more powerful position and much more elevated above the ordinary senators than was the case before. So in this way, um, times had changed at the start um, uh, at when, when uh, Trajan um, built his forum. So what is interesting to notice here is, um, uh, well, uh, first of all, the date. So it was built between about 106 and 112 um, AD <coughs> on the order of Trajan himself as the literary sources inform us, and there is now also a fragmentary inscription that has been found that was on one of the buildings which seems to confirm that. A very rare instance where we know the name of the architect, um, who was Apollodorus of Damascus. It was by far the largest of the imperial fora, and even a hill had to be leveled in order to produce enough horizontal space for this forum to exist. So the hill um, on the, on the northeastern slope of the capital line, that had been brought down. And the inscription tells us that the column of Trajan, which we are looking at in a moment, um, is actually as high as the mountain was that had been um, that had been removed to make space for the forum. Now, whether that is literary true, literally true, um, we do not know. Um, but it is clear that large um, um, a large amount of leveling work was needed to make the forum. Um, you can see it probably best here in this plan where we have the Forum of Augustus in yellow here, uh, the Forum of Caesar, to which it was um, added uh, here in, in pink, uh, then the Forum of Nerva um, and the, the Forum uh, Parkis um, by Vespasian, you know, first this, then this. Uh, they were all built previously and then Trajan decided to use this whole space um, for his own new forum. And then on the slopes, there are the Trajanic, the markets um, above the forum, which were built roughly at the same time. You can see the same here in this nice illustration. We have the Forum of Augustus here. Uh, this drawing was made when it wasn't uh, already, it, when it wasn't clear whether there was, uh, was a second set of exedrae, um, so, so they are missing from this illustration, and there are scholars who doubt that they ever existed, I should say. Um, but this is the Forum of Augustus, um, and everything from there until over there is the Forum of Trajan, which in fact has two sets of apses, um, one that is opening to a huge open piazza here in the center, and another one, another set, which was um, added to the short sides of a huge basilica, a huge covered building of the basilica. So there, we definitely have two sets of exit drive, whereas with the Forum of Augustus, we are not 100% uh, sure. But we can see <coughs> that the very fact that we do have these exedrae, um, which the other forums obviously did not have, and which are not necessarily a feature that we have in, in fora in other cities around Italy or the Roman world, they are a very particular feature. And so we can infer that probably they are meant as a deliberate a, a deliberate citation, a deliberate quote from the Forum of Augustus. 
Just like authors, ancient writers, could use quotes from, from texts that had a very high prestige, so quotes from Homer were, were obviously particularly popular. So like writers could use quotes from highly regarded other writers, the same we can find with artists and with, art, uh, with architects who cited elements of well-known buildings or artworks in order to make a reference. And I just said that Trajan, after, um, uh, after the assassination of, um, of Domitian and the short rule of Nerva, he made an effort to re-establish good relations with the Senate. And, and, and to revive some of the, um, of the rules of conduct between emperor and senate. Um, and so we may actually see here also the reason for using these exedra and citation from the Forum of Augustus um, so that he was linking himself and what he was doing to the great Augustus whose importance um, obviously was never challenged. Um, there are another, uh, an, uh, yeah. um, first of all, um, then of course we have the column of Trajan which was not erected in the main open space of the piazza. There was a statue of the emperor on horseback um, just as we had the quadriga of Augustus that has been omitted in this reconstruction. So I, I find these reconstructions extremely useful, but they, ha they help us to visualize what it may have looked like, but they are sometimes, they are not perfectly exact. So Augustus' statue is missing, uh, but this one is correct. Um, but the column was not in this huge open space, but it was situated in a small courtyard on the other side of this large basilica. So here again you have this small courtyard uh, where the column was situated. On the base of the column, which you see, column on the right, base of the column on the, uh, in the left corner, um, you can see uh, there was an inscription over an entrance into the column. Inside the column there was a spiral spa staircase on which one could go right up to the, to the top uh, where still one can go today um, if you're lucky and, and um, you, you get the opportunity. So there was, this was the entrance to the spiral staircase um, in the base and then in the column itself. And above the entrance, <clears throat> there was the inscription for the dedication of the column. Now, not of the forum, but of the column. And that dedication said, the Senate and people of Rome give or dedicate this to the Emperor Caesar, son of divine Nerva, Nerva Traianus Augustus Germanicus Dacicus, so that's the titles of uh, Trajan, Pontifex Maximus, in his 17th year in the office of tribune, having been acclaimed six times as imperator, six times consul, pater patriae, to demonstrate of what great height the hill was and place that was removed for such great works. So this is the information on you know, the height of the hill and the, the pride in the building works that were done to, um, uh, to, to create this forum. Um, and in this case, it is the Senate who is dedicating the column to Trajan, whereas officially it was Trajan who built the forum itself. Now, this is absolutely possible that he built the forum and the Senate decided to donate a particularly precious element to this forum nothing particularly dubious about it. The reason that is given there, um, to mark the site, so it, it doesn't say, uh, you know, it was dedicated as such and such, it was dedicated to mark, to demonstrate the height of the hill. 
Now, wh why, would, why would that be something to celebrate? It was clearly a major engineering feat, wasn't it? And um, if you look at the reliefs on the column of Trajan itself, which we won't do in detail today, but I'm doing another lecture in a few weeks' time. Um, if you look at the scenes on the column itself, it is really interesting to see that of all the activities that took place on the military campaigns that were depicted on the column, there are huge numbers of scenes with building works. So, it looks like building works were something, were a matter of real pride at the time. And they also were something, were a demonstration of superiority over the barbarians. But that is a different story. Um, so very interesting inscription. What the inscription does not mention is that this column would have been designated as the tomb of Trajan and his wife Plotina. Um, already in 1907, this drawing here was made of the, in, of the interior of the column bays, and you see a, a floor plan of it over there, um, where it was suggested, and still many scholars believe so today, that in this little dark chamber, um, two scenery urns, ash chests, with the burned remains of the empress and the emperor were set up. It's obvious that no sarcophagus would have fitted there, so the assumption is that Trajan was burned, and his wife as well, which creates other problems, but that's a different story again. Um, we can see in this drawing that the space inside was, was really, really narrow. You could only just step in, and then there was the beginning of the staircase, which went up here, and then round and round and round, and a little kind of corridor there. There are no proper windows there. And then on the back, there is something like a kind of bench or table of stone, the suggestion was that the urns was, were placed there. Now, we know from literary sources that Trajan was buried under or very close to his column. And that has given ray, rise to the suggestion that he was actually buried in, uh, the, in, in this phase. Um, but scholars have recently doubted this and it is, in fact, very difficult to assume that an emperor's grave should be inaccessible, basically inaccessible, like it is here. And also that the inscription over the door made absolutely no mention of the fact that he was actually buried very close by, in a so far unknown place, um, um, in, in, in the vicinity. There are other things which are hugely, heavily, which are, which, are, which are debated a lot. We know, again from literary sources, that there was also a temple for the deified Trajan. That temple was erected by his successor, uh, Hadrian. Trajan, like many emperors before him, was deified after his death by the Senate, and then he uh, received a temple. In, <clears throat> uh, in old reconstructions, like this one here, um, the suggestion was that the temple must have been um, on, so here we have the piazza again, on the other side of the basilica with the column here, and then the temple facing, essentially facing uh, the, the column. This suggestion could be made until the excavations for the new Metroline Sea started in this area. 
um, and a few other excavations which have clearly shown that in this location there never was a temple like that. So much is clear. What is unclear is where exactly this temple was and also how the architect, what the architectural situation outside of the forum uh, as it is preserved, uh, what, what that looked like. There is uh, an ongoing debate um, with the protagonists, the most um, active people debating this being James Packer and Roberto Meneghini, who led the excavations in Rome, um, where Meneghini proposes that the forum was actually uh, concluded there, um, and the entrance gate to the forum, which is depicted on coins, that this entrance gate was there. <clears throat> um, that looks like a plausible reconstruction. Um, and very little archaeological evidence has been found, um, but the evidence that has been found is not contradicting that situation. Now Menegini had the problem of where to put the temple. And he proposed that the temple would have been at the other end of the forum, um, right next to the one exedra of the Forum of Augustus. So between the Forum of Augustus and the actual Forum of Trajan. Now the difficulty is there that the remains that have been excavated are very unspectacular. They don't really look like a temple for the imperial cult. And um, so there are doubts about this reconstruction as well. Um, and I don't think for our question this is important at the moment. I should say I myself, I find it hard to believe that the temple was squeezed in between the two fora. Um, but I also believe that Menegini's reconstruction of the entrance situation is pretty convincing. So maybe we need to locate the temple a little bit further away of the forum and somewhere in an area which has not yet been completely excavated. And as you probably know, there are lots of palazzi around that area and areas that have not been and could not be excavated so far. Um, so I think that there, that, that, is, that is still no solution for that. I should perhaps also say um, the early reconstructions obviously had to put this gate somewhere and they put the gate at this end. Now, when you only take the forum in isolation, the gate looks beautiful. You can easily put a gate there and it's nice. You can enter through the gate into the forum, but only if you consider that this end of the forum was surrounded by the other fora you understand that such a gate at this end does not make sense. It's impossible because you, you know, you can't even, you don't, you, you don't even have the distance if there was a door from the Forum of Augustus over to there or a door from the Forum of Julius Caesar over there. You know, you ended up in a, in a small space and then you have this, this huge, no, that's impossible. So we have to place this, um, this, um, entrance gate uh, with, you know, quadriga and divinities and lots of statuary. We have to put that somewhere and I think the only plausible space for that is really on that end of the forum. But the temple is still, you know, still big question mark. Um, so the entrance situation and the situation of the temple, they, they are very closely uh, closely connected, and to some extent also <clears throat> the, the grave of um, Trajan. Now, let's look at the features of the forum uh, itself. Um, the space of the forum was um, decorated with imagery that all refer in one way or another 
to military activities. Um, there are porticos around. Uh, so, so I should say this is a view from the Forum onto the Basilica and those are the porticos all around in this reconstruction. <coughs> so, in, so in these porticos, there were, again, niches, like we had them in the Forum of Augustus. But this time, there were no statues in the niches, but the standards of the various armies or the various parts of the armies under Trajan. Trajan on horseback in the center, we have already mentioned. And then there were captured statues of captured barbarians, which were, and, and again, there are, it is not entirely clear whether they featured all around the forum or just on certain parts. These vertical elements, which you can make out, the dark ones, those are statues made of colored marble, um, most of them colored, some are white, as, as you see in this example on the right. Statues of barbarians over which um, uh, Trajan uh, had won his victories. So Parthians and Dacians uh, are identified among them. So we have the military theme there. We also believe that at least part of the portico in the upper zone of the attic was decorated with a frieze that showed the campaigns of Trajan themselves. Now, we do not have any of these reliefs preserved or in the Forum of Trajan. None of them have been recovered there, but we have reliefs that were reused in the Arch of Constantine, um, which, because of their style and the faces, um, are likely to date to the time of Trajan. Now, I should say there are, that, that there are some scholars who believe that the style is more that of Domitian um, and that the frieze may not be Trajanic after all. Um, but so far, I find it more convincing that these are, in fact, Trajanic, also when we compare the way that the barbarians are being depicted. Um, so, if that is correct, what the majority of scholars believe, that these frieze pieces um, belong to the Forum of Trajan, then a likely location may be in the upper attic somewhere, in, uh, somewhere around this courtyard. Another very strong uh, military element being depicted here. Now, uh, obviously then we have uh, the column itself, which we won't discuss in great detail. Here you have the, the quadriga of the triumphant emperor in this reconstruction. Um, uh, it is on the inside uh, of the forum. So you see that scholars are by no means um, uh, all of the same opinion. Um, and we have the column which is, as we have seen in the plans before, wedged in between other buildings. And, um, and, and it was flanked by two libraries, one Latin, one Greek, we are being told by the literary sources. Now, when we think of libraries, we think of, you know, Homer and Sophocles and Cicero and, uh, you know, those kinds of books um, in the, for the ancient world. But actually, when we look at documentation of libraries around the Roman world, they were often much more archives than libraries. They did not necessarily contain literature, but they very often contained archival material descriptions of war, um, documents that were related to the management and ruling of the state. So 
we should not necessarily assume that this is finally a particularly civil element of, um, you know, of, of element that refers to Trajan's in interest in education and philosophy and the arts. Um, because these libraries may, in fact, you know, be more archives related, again, perhaps to his military campaigns. And, um, uh, and, and that would also then fit very nicely with the idea of the column here, which is the first one of um, very few that were built in the ancient world, where this spiraling relief is um, decorated, I think that's the next, yeah, that's the next um, photograph, were decor decorated with images depicting the, uh, the Dacian Wars, starting with how the army uh, uh, crosses a river and sets out and ending at the very top with the suicide of Decibalos, um, so the, the um, uh, the barbarian uh, leader, and in between we have images of actual fighting, but far more images um, uh, of building works, of the emperor addressing the crowd, addressing his soldiers, of um, barbarians asking for mercy, um, and uh, sacrifices, lots of sacrifices on the column as well. So while the column ha seems to narrate the two Dacian wars in a sequence, um, it is pretended that this is the documentation of how the, how the war happened. And the spiraling has remained, uh, reminded scholars of book rolls Obviously, books were no codices where you turn pages, but they were rolls, and when you, when you push them a little bit, you would end up with this kind of spiraling um, pattern. So, <clears throat> people were reminded of the book rolls, which were in those libraries, and said maybe the idea behind this particular design <coughs> of the column was to, to provide a kind of book in images, a book roll, but in imagery. Um, so this, this is the column in the center. Now, what do we make of this? We have clearly the Emperor Trajan involved um, as the person who initiated the forum. We have a hugely militaristic program here despite the allusions to the Forum of Augustus. But then again, as we have seen, the Forum of Augustus also had quite a, mili quite a lot of military associations. And then we have the Senate dedicating this column, effectively celebrating the emperor and his wars. Now, I suppose you agree that the, that the situation is getting a bit more complicated about messages. Are we to think that maybe by that time the Senate and the Emperor actually had the same aims and goals and the same ideas about what Rome's gra greatness consisted in? Or is it that perhaps at the time the Senate was less powerful to express its own ideas. Um, so we don't have any direct sources. Nobody, no ancient author is telling us any of that. But when we look at the letters of Pliny, for instance, we could see arguably this strategy of wanting to please the emperor and to, you know, to, to, to agree with him on what he is doing, even though sometimes trying to you know, manipulate him a little bit and saying, you are the greatest doing this and this, um, but maybe that wasn't necessarily what he had intended. Um, so much for the, for the forum of um, Trajan. Are there any further questions?
No. Okay, then I would like to conclude very briefly with a final example of a monument from the city of Rome where the Senate wasn't involved, nor was the emperor involved, but that was a relatively modest, but still quite nice dedication of an arch with lots of reliefs and an inscription, a dedicatory inscription, um, which is called the Arch of the Argentarii. It is an entrance gate to the Forum Boarium, so to one to the forum adjacent to the Forum Romanum, this area which was essentially a marketplace, very close to the river. So this is, this is the river Tiber here. Um, and, um, oh sorry, no, this is, that's not correct. That's not correct. This is the quadrifonts. Sorry, forget about this. It is still very close to the Forum Boarium, I can, I can um, assure you. Um, and this arch was erected in 103-4 by the Argentari, which are bankers, essentially, and other traders. So the location at the Forum Boarium for this dedication makes full sense. It's people who were doing their business there on the Forum and at the, um, and at the borders of the Forum, they erected this arch as a dedication to the emperor. I should also mention that arches in the Roman world are pretty much always, at least the, the isolated, so this was later built in, in a, in a, into a modern building, so originally you know, it would have been symmetrical and freestanding. Um, and arches of this kind typically had statuary on top. So, we call them triumphal arches, but not all arches celebrated triumphs. And even those, even those who did celebrate triumphs were effectively monumental statue bases because the key things were the statues on top. There were always gilded bronze statues normally on top of the arches. And we tend to forget that because they are not preserved. But we know from coins and from descriptions that there were always statues on top. And the marble arch was more like a gigantic statue base. Now, they decided to dedicate an arch to, um, uh, to um, Septimius Severus, his wife, Julia Domna, his two sons, Caracalla and Geta, and also um, to Caracalla's wife, um, Ful, uh, Fulvia Plautilla, who was the daughter of a certain Plautianus, who was a very influential and powerful um, member of the ruling classes, who at one stage fell out with the emperor. And so the arch was changed several times, you will see in a moment. First, after the fall of Plautianus, after he had fallen from grace, his image was removed and his inscription was removed from, uh, from the, so his name was removed from the inscription of the arch. Then Plautilla was removed and her name was removed um, after she was murdered. And finally, after Caracalla had also murdered his brother, also his name and his images were removed. So that is an interesting phenomenon um, which is not our subject today, but how you know, people who had fallen from grace were then removed from public monuments. <clears throat> this is the um, image, the, the relief on one side uh, inside the arch, you can see this is the, the ceiling of the arch, it's not terribly wide, um, where we have this relief. On the bottom there are lots of sacred paraphernalia, um, a patara, a, um, an offering dish, there is a little altar, there is an axe which is used to kill an ox or to kill a sacrificial animal, um, there is a skull of uh, an animal, um, of, a, of a bull, 
Um, there are small daggers, which are also used to kill animals. So lots of sacrificial, yeah, here we can see them a little bit better, sacrificial um, objects that, that are used in cult. And this um, somewhat crude drawing gives an idea of what the relief originally looked like. We can still see some of the outline of Plautianus here, and then some of the others, and, and this may have been, you know, about what the relief originally looked like. With Geta, even though being, you know, not still a teenager, uh, sorry, Caracalla, even though being still a teenager, he was the eldest son and the heir of the throne, and Plautianus a little bit smaller because he was less significant, um, and then Caracalla's wife uh, on the other side of the altar. Um, so a sacrificial scene. Um, and there are garlands and other things um, which, which you know, relate to um, abundance and well-being and, um, and also to um, sacrifices. On the other side, we have Septimius Severus himself. Um, here he is. Um, his wife, Julia Domna, in the center. And then another missing figure um, who, in this case, must be Geta, and who has been chiseled away after he was murdered. Now, um, and again, here at the bottom, we have lots of uh, elements. So this is the pointed cup of some of the priests. Also, the litus is the augurs um, uh, device, um, and other elements that are typically used for sacrifices. Here we have now um, the celebration of the MP imperial family from these bankers and traders. And again, of all the imagery that could have been chosen to celebrate the emperor, which we know from other monuments or which we know from coins, what they have chosen is religious imagery. They have chosen to depict the imperial family in the act of sacrificing sacrificing to the gods. And this is not just about their personal, their personal character. It is not just about showing them being pious individuals, like we would that understand that today, you know, depicting one of us um, in a public image as we are praying in a church or in a mosque would be a comment on us as a person who, be, who as a believer. Um, in the Roman world, being a pious person who respects the gods was also the guarantee that the state would prosper because only with the support of the gods could everybody have a good life, would Rome live on and prosper. And so showing the emperors engaged in sacrifices is far more than just a comment on their personalities. So what they are essentially exp expressing here in this imagery is that the imperial family may go on and, um, and worship and honor the gods so that the trade of the traders would be would go on and they would benefit from the good times that are the result of good relationships with the divine with the divine um, i have only shown you very few examples today to make my point but if we go through other monuments and we consider other monuments not just from Rome, but also from around the empire, where it wasn't the senate or uh, the emperor, but often local communities who dedicated arches and other relief decorated monuments. I feel that we can learn so much more from these monuments if we consider that they were not created by the emperor or by his spin doctors, but that they were designed by the people who dedicated them, who gave their own interpretation to what they felt the Roman Empire should be like. 
and the emperor should be like. We can see that even in late antique panegyrics, where the emperor is often praised, even in modern politics, where people are being praised for doing something or showing certain character features, which we are not really sure whether they do possess them, but where we think it would really be good if they did. So praising someone who you cannot publicly criticize or where you can't walk up and say, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea to do this or that, or to be a bit milder or be, to be a bit more, you know, whatever. Um, where when we live in relationships, in political situations, where this is not possible, praising someone for something that we want them to possess or to, we want them to be is a very powerful and important way of negotiating power with these powerful individuals. So by looking at public monuments from that angle, we may actually learn a lot less about what the emperor really thought about himself, but we may learn a lot about how the Roman people in different places, in different, at different times, how they wanted the emperor and the empire to function. And personally, I find that far more exciting than knowing what Septimus Severus really thought about this. Um, I am coming to an end with this, but I'm happy to answer questions if there still are any. Okay, then I thank you very much for your attention and um, buona serata a tutti.